Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the Red Fest stage, Sierra Science CEO, Dr. Bill Andrews. Hello, thank you very much for being here. Um, this is a slide I wanted to show because I've been very interested in finding a cure for aging my entire life. My mother thought I was nuts, uh, but it was my father who put the idea into my head. She thought he was nuts too. But I've been really wanting to focus on this word, cure aging. Now, it's a word a lot of people have told me I'm not supposed to use because aging is not a disease. I'm glad to see a lot of people are now using that. But that was what my father called it when he said to me when I was 10 years old, when you grow up, find a cure for aging. So that's what I've been doing. <clears throat> so curing aging is a lot of things. Okay, in order, if you're going to do it, you got to, you got to know what aging is, you got to know why we age, you got to know how we age. And after you know that stuff, then you can start figuring out how to undo aging. And so that's what I've been doing my whole life, is trying to learn all these different things. Now, I can't talk about them all today, but, but I'm going to try probably do a series of talks where I'm going to talk each one, uh, about each one of them at future RadFest. But today, I want to focus on why we age, which is a very, very misunderstood thing by a lot of people. So why we age can also be thought of as why is there a limit on our lifespan? Why don't we live forever? Why do we have this theoretical maximum of 125 years? And more importantly, why didn't we ever evolve a way to not age? If, if that's such a bad thing for us, wouldn't evolution have figured out a way to make it so we don't age? And the same is true for cancer, heart disease, stroke, Alzheimer's. Why do we still all get that after life's been around for four billion years? Why are we still getting all that stuff? Why haven't we evolved a way not to get it? So that's why I want to talk about evolution today. And, and just for the record, I'm not talking about telomeres today, which is what I always talk about. It's always my research. But I'm very glad to hear that Liz Parrish did say that it was the number one gene for gene therapy. And I'm glad to see that other speakers also spoke about telomeres and telomerase. But <clears throat> evolution can be, when, when you usually think about evolution, you think about uh, when and where. Okay, so, so there's a lot of, lot of people, or what and when, sorry. See, you always hear about when did this evolve to that and things like that. But what I need to talk about is how and why. How, how did it happen and why did it happen? And that subject is called population genetics. And my PhD, this doesn't work, my PhD is in molecular and population genetics. So 45 years ago, this is what I was studying in graduate school, was these two things, molecular genetics and population genetics. And what I'm going to be talking about today is mostly from a thesis that I wrote 45 years ago. But population genetics is how to understand evolution. Molecular genetics is how to understand the mechanisms that are used in evolution and how to control those things. So those two things are very important to me because I've got to understand them all to be able to figure out how to do what my mission in life is, to cure aging. So first, I'm going to just talk about evolution for a little while. And I want to get some basics because there's, again, a lot of misconceptions about evolution. Evolution is not a force. It's a result. There's no hand. There's no mother nature that's controlling how evolution is going to occur. It's just a result of environmental changes, who survives, who doesn't. Evolution is not about the survival of the individual. It's not, you know, we always hear fittest, the, the survival of the fittest, but it's actually the fittest Species, not the fittest individual. That's got to be important because it's all about survival of the species. And survival of the species, I mean, since none of us and nobody has ever been immortal, no single cell or no animal has ever been immortal, in order for the species to survive, one of the most important things in that species is its ability to be able to reproduce. And let's see, I want to go back there. And then... What I also want to say is that mutations, because another misconception, mutations are always random. 
Okay, the reason some exist and some don't is because some are sustainable and some aren't. Okay, there's no force driving the formation of mutations. Okay, so getting back to now why we age. There's two explanations that I want to discuss. One I call the irrelevant and the other one I call the relevant. Okay, so the irrelevant means that it doesn't really have anything to do with the success of the survival of the species. Okay, there's one reason I'm gonna explain for that that has nothing to do with survival of the species. But the other one, the relevant one, does affect the ability of the species to survive. And I'm gonna first just quickly talk about the irrelevant approach. But I gotta start off with two definitions. Because I don't use old and young, okay? I use longer lived and shorter lived. And my definition of shorter lived is anybody that has not lived long enough to reproduce yet or to raise their young. To reproduction requires not just giving birth, but also getting that baby to be, be able to fend for itself. So shorter lived means you have uh, not had, uh, you've not raised your offspring yet. Longer lived means you have raised your offspring and they can now fend for themselves. <clears throat> okay, so. If a mutation, now keep in mind those, the definition of shorter lived and longer lived. If a mutation eliminates the shorter lived, it's not sustainable, okay? That's because if you get a mutation and you don't have offspring, that mutation never goes anywhere except in you and the mutation dies out when you die out, okay? So that's irrelevant, okay? But if a mutation occurs that doesn't manifest itself until after you've raised your young, then that mutation gets passed on to your offspring, gets passed on to their offspring, and that mutation becomes sustainable. So now if it's a mutation that eliminates the longer lived, it's, it's not gonna disappear because the longer lived person already reproduced their young. Elimination of the longer lived is irrelevant. Okay, if, you, if it's a mutation that affects you only after you've raised your young. Well, there's a lot of these kind of things. We all know these things, mutations that cause heart disease, cancer, dementia, on and on and on. All these things, somehow, they seem to affect the longer lived a lot, lot more than the shorter lived. So as a result, even though these mutations that cause cancer and heart disease carry on through those species, it only really eliminates the ones that have already uh, <clears throat> lived long enough to raise their young. So a reason why we age is because we have randomly accumulated a lot of these mutations that eliminate the longer lived and there's absolutely nothing to stop them and there's nothing, and there was nothing to make them go away. And so we've just accumulated all these mutations and aging might be simply an accumulation of all these different ways of eliminating the longer lived. So we age. Okay, so that's one that had nothing to do with really the survival of the species. But the other one, relevant, that's what I wanna spend most of my time on. There's a, there's a thing that I you know, learned 45 years ago that affects how, we, affects how get, eliminating the longer lived actually is be beneficial to the species. And so I, I want to start off with saying that when I was a kid, and maybe a lot of the longer lived people remember this, marbles, kids playing with marbles was a big deal. And the kid who always had the most different types of marbles was always the one that won. Well, <clears throat> the key to evolution is also variety. So having the most variety in your species is the way for, to increase the survival of the species. So I want to think of this, so I want to think of a species as a flask. Marbles in the flask are the uh, individuals in the species. And then the color is a trait. So I'm just going to go walk through an example of what I mean about variety here. So we have a flask here with red marbles in it. There's only one trait. Every, every member of the species has the same trait. Okay, now let's say we have another species it has a different trait. Okay, now all of a sudden, the environment changes. It's sometimes a very rapidly changing environment, like an asteroid hitting the Earth or something like that. 
there's lots of these things, asteroids, volcanoes, ice ages, earthquakes, on and on and on. Probably one of the biggest evolutionary changes in the environment lately has been the introduction of humans. But now, suppose the one species is, can't live in this new environment, the other one can. Well, that species dies out and becomes extinct, and the other one survives. So there was no benefit in having everybody be identical because everybody died out. Now suppose we go back to that species that just survived, and suppose they did have some very variety within their species. Okay, so they did have some people with the red trait, even though they're not the same species. Well, that environmental change again occurs, and now at least some of them survive. And those ones that survive can grow back to rebuild the species. And so this, the animals that went extinct, they were the ones that did not have anybody to repopulate the species. So we have these people, we have these individuals in the species that now have lived, but now they've come back, and if, they, if the species had developed any good traits, it, it evolved a way to create variety. So now some of them are blue. And then maybe even some of them are yellow. Okay, so think of a whole world of a whole bunch of different species, and some of them have more variety than others. In a rapidly changing environment, the species here, so I've got six different species, the species here that's most likely to survive is the one with the most variety. <clears throat> and that's the key that I want to save for the rest of my talk. So evolution, I'm going to give you a definition of evolution right now. Evolution is a series of sustainable random events, mostly mutations, that increase the genetic variety within a species, that increases the chances that at least some members of the species will survive rapidly changing environments. That's a really key thing right there because that's all evolution is. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take you through, well, variety is the key of this thing. I wanna take you through a kind of a journey of the evolution of variability. Variability means it's a method, mechanism to create variety within the species. So <clears throat> there's, there's been, th from the beginning of time, this is a four billion plus year old journey. From the very beginning, there was life, okay? Suddenly there was a life. As I said before, life's, a life is not immortal, so that life was gonna have to reproduce. Now, that first life occurred approximately 3.7 to 4.5 billion years ago. And it had a chromosome, or had DNA, that it, regulated, that controlled everything about it. Now, as Jose just got finished saying, some organisms don't have chromosomes that look like this, so I'm gonna draw all my chromosomes looking like this, okay? They're just a linear kind of molecule, and along these chromosomes are genes. Okay, so that's what makes a life form, is the genes inside the cell on the chromosome. Okay, so now this really isn't an evolutionary, the next thing I'm gonna say is not really an evolutionary kind of thing because it probably was there from the beginning, but mutations, mutations to that chromosome, such as shown here, that creates variety, okay? So the ability to be mutated created variety and when life first began. And as a result, even it created new species some differences, some got so different from each other that it became new species. And some of these species actually had the ability to go back and reinfect cells and actually cause more changes, actually insert new genes and stuff like that in the chromosomes. This was the next level of variability that we evolved in the last four billion years. It's called horizontal transfer. The problem that was still existing was that the genes were sometimes very lethal to the, to the organism. And so if you had a mutation that was really bad, it would kill off the gene. But it could have been beneficial to the species in the long run because sometimes two negatives can make a positive, and sometimes the environment might change really drastically, and that new mutation is what's gonna allow everybody to survive, 
and everybody who doesn't have a mutation get, dies out. So the next step in the evolution of variability was the development of ploidy, which means having more than one copy of every chromosome. So now you could have mutations that would allow the organism to still survive even though that mutation could have been lethal otherwise. So these are things that we've been seeing. It's a journey of increasing variability in, throughout time. Okay, so as I said, nobody's immortal. They, <clears throat> so in order for a species to stay, stay, stay around, it has to uh, reproduce, it has to divide. So at the beginning, throughout time, cells divided by what's called asexual reproduction. So this is how life for the first two billion years occurred. It was all by asexual reproduction. And then, and then some big major change occurred. Okay, <clears throat> this is probably the biggest thing, change in, in terms of increasing variability that ever occurred in the history of evolution. And that was sexual reproduction. For the first time, we could now shuffle our genes. So you could have one organism with some genes, one organism with another gene, male and a female breed, and they create a new organism that has genes shuffled. There's also genetic recombination that was going on at the time, and also mutations were still occurring at the time. So this was a tremendous improvement about two billion years ago, where suddenly the variability of species increased dramatically. Okay, I wanna go back to the definitions. <clears throat> Shorter lived, hasn't raised their young yet. Longer lived, has raised their young. Okay, so we go back to this, so the top line is the longer lived, the bottom row is the shorter lived. Okay, what happens now when the shorter lived intermingle and breed? Well, they create a whole bunch of new varieties, especially one shown here in this A, B, C. These are, the A, B, and C are not genes in the same loci. I'm considering these traits within the species for anybody who's into genetics. But as a result, the variability, the variety within the species increased more by, by letting the offspring interbreed than by letting the parents rebreed. So as a result, one of the things that benefited the species to increase the variety within our species and every other species was eliminating the longer lived. So it turned out that if you eliminated the longer lived, your species had a better chance of surviving than not because if you just let the parents, the original parents, just keep rebreeding and rebreeding, there would not be very much variability and the species was more likely to not survive a rapidly changing environment. So, that's what I call elimination of the longer lived. That was an evolutionary stage that occurred in practically every species on the planet because the species that didn't eliminate the longer lived died out, they went extinct because they didn't survive rapidly changing environments as well as the organisms and animals that did eliminate the longer lived. So elimination of the longer lived is relevant to the survival of the species during rapidly changing environments. Again, let me li make that list. So it doesn't always go. Okay. The list of things that we already know, all these things that eliminate the longer lived, they are very detrimental to the individuals within the species. But they are beneficial to the species as a whole. And that's why we have, one of the reasons why we have evolved a way to, to age. We evolved elimination of longer lived because it increases the genetic variety of our species. And the bottom line is elimination of the longer lived increased genetic, the genetic variety of our species, which increased the ability of our species to survive rapidly changing environments. This is a reason why we age. So let me just summarize. I talked about two different reasons why we age. One is mutations that eliminate the longer lived are sustainable. There's no re reason to get rid of them, and as a result, they accumulate. Oops. And the other one was the other one was that elimination of the longer lived increases variety within our species, which allows to survive rapidly changing environments. Are they the only reasons? 
Maybe not. But they do explain everything we know about aging. There's no other explanations that are necessary, though a lot of people keep coming up with them. We will always have, we will never evolve ways to not have these diseases, not have aging. <clears throat> and we're going to have to do this ourselves if we're ever going to want to see this go away. So come back to RADFest to hear about all the things that are going to be happening. I think it's the best place to, in the world. There's the best place right now to come and hear what's going on. But there are other places in the world, like Transvision in Spain, Healthy Masters in Portugal, uh, <clears throat> Afro Longevity in South America, South Africa. So there are places, but RADFest is really the place you're always going to see me. I've never missed a single RADFest. I want to just end with my vision. Um, I think living is the greatest thing that ever happened to any of us. I love living, and I don't want to see living become any less lovable for any of us just because of this dumb thing called aging. And I believe humans can now control their own evolution, and my mission is to actually do something about curing aging. Thank you very much.